Both of them have served not only in terms of, look, of, of the governance of the school, um, but also in the development of finance uh, faculty here to be what it is today, um, and on many of the developments of the programmes, I mean, including the Masters in Finance programme, um, so things which are you know, central to the, to the way the London Business School operates. Um, so I'd just like to take this opportunity, both of you, to say thank you so much on behalf of the institution. We're looking back as part of the 50th as of all the things that have happened and have come across many great things, and, and Paul Melroy have been very much part of, part of that. Um, I should also mention Mike Staunton. with Mike? It's St. Patrick's Day. He couldn't Oh, uh, right. Thank you. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> because um, Mike has also been, been uh, very involved in this work this evening, and I know he's been a, he's been a great collaborator over many years with both, both Paul and Elroy. Um, I, I don't think I really ought to say any more, because Paul and Elroy can speak uh, very much for themselves, and I don't want to take up any more time anyway. So can I have you, Paul, Elroy, whichever one's going to start? Thank you very much. Thanks, Andrew. You're, as always, too kind. A very warm welcome to everybody. Um, it's wonderful to see how prosperous all the alumni are. I saw, I saw the cars outside. I was, I was impressed. Um, so welcome back. It's really, really good to see you. We're going to be talking tonight about um, what should I do with my money. It's a rather ambitious topic, and we've got quite a lot to cover, uh, because we made too many promises on the invitation as to the asset classes that we would talk about. So um, without further ado, let me dive into the presentation. Since, not 1900, but since uh, 1999, Mike Staunton, Elroy and myself have been working on a long-term returns project. What we've been trying to do is assemble long-run rates of return on asset classes around the world. The reason we wanted to do this was because when we started back in 1999, almost everything we knew about rates of return on equities, bonds, cash, inflation, and so on, came from the United States. And if you picked up a textbook in corporate finance or in investments, it would give you the United States evidence, and it would also give you the impression that that held good for the rest of the world, and it also held good not just for the past, but for the future. The way we thought about it was that the United States has actually been a rather successful economy during the 20th century. It's been the uh, superpower. It's been the superpower in terms of economics, in terms of finance, in terms of the military. And it wouldn't be surprising if when we looked at the United States, the returns that investors had enjoyed were rather good. What about the rest of the world? What we wanted to do was globalize it and look at returns from the rest of the world. So that's what we've been doing. It's a labor of love. You have to be seriously sad to do this sort of thing. And we've put together now a database of, um, of 23 countries for which we've got a full 115 years of coverage on stocks, bonds, bills, inflation, currency, and GDP. There are a couple of countries in the sample, China and Russia, which don't have continuous histories and I'll come to explaining why we wanted to include those in a moment. And each year we update this work through the Global Investment Returns Yearbook, and right at the end of the session, um, Elroy will show you a slide, which is how to get free downloads of the uh, Global Investment Returns Yearbook, uh, should you wish, which is unlikely, uh, to read further about our work. 
So a lot of what we're going to be talking about tonight is from this long-run historical database. And Elroy has gone much further with this. Uh, he's not just been content with stocks, bonds, bills, inflation, currency. He's also gathered long-run data on works of art, violins, wine, all sorts of things, stamps, and so on. And finally, we're also going to talk a little bit about the returns from SIN, which we thought might um, be interesting. Uh, so this is the title, What Should I Do With My Money? I now have to confess that we're going to be telling you more about what you should have done with your money, because uh, <laughs> we're going to be able to tell you very precisely where you could have made money in the past, um, but we're going to try and say something about, uh, about the future as well. So I'm going to look at the, the bog standard assets, uh, cash, equities, bonds, and currency. I'm always going to look at the more exotic things like real estate, gold, art, stamps, wine, and sin and corruption. And then finally, we'll say a few words about sort of personal planning. How on earth do you decide uh, between all these asset classes and what to do with your money? So let's start with cash. And um, uh, the obvious thing we all know is interest rates have never been lower. The Bank of England has a database of interest rates going back to 1694. And interest rates have never been as low as today with base rates at half a percent. Uh, which they've been at for six years now. I think if you put yourself back to 2009, when they first went down to half a percent, uh, you would really have never predicted that six years later they'd still be at that level. So interest rates are very low. It's not just a, a UK thing. That's true throughout most of the developed world. Now, these are nominal interest rates. These are the rates you get. Uh, what you should think about, of course, is the real interest rate. Uh, the real interest rate is simply... Uh, the short-term cash rate or the rate you get on government bills minus inflation. And the reason you should think about things in real terms is because that tells you how your purchasing power is going to uh, expand. This chart shows the real interest rate, the average real interest rate for the USA, the UK, and for all of our yearbook countries. And you can see that for the first eight decades of the 20th century, real interest rates were actually pretty low. This is the average interest rate minus inflation rate uh, in the USA over the first 80 years and the UK and in the average across all of the countries we look at. So real interest rates were very low. Then we got to the 1980s and central banks decided that they needed to conquer inflation and so they started to raise short-term interest rates as a weapon against um, inflation and to drive inflation out of the system. And we've now had 28 years up to, 19, up to 2008 of extremely high uh, real interest rates. And then, of course, the financial crisis came, and real interest rates have been extraordinarily low since then because central bankers then took the opposite view, which was that in order to survive and to uh, reboot the economy, you needed very low interest rates. Now, the problem with this is that people talk about when will interest rates get back to normal? The question is, what's normal? This 28-year period is the period that sort of dominated most of our careers, and we tended to think about really quite high real interest rates. Uh, but that really wasn't typical. This certainly isn't typical. What could we expect for the future? Maybe something closer to when interest rates do finally normalize, perhaps about 1% real. Uh, but this and this is what sort of affects our expectations and our thoughts, um, I think is as unreal in some ways as this is. And, um, and this, of course, had two world wars. So well, even when you look over very long run periods of history, you can see that it is a little bit confusing. And um, the point I'm making here really is that at the moment, real interest rates are extraordinarily low, but even when they normalize, it's quite hard to know uh, what will be normal. Interest rates are currently very low. Are they about to go up and normalize? Well, one way we could get some clues on that is to look at the term structure of interest rates. And the term structure of interest rates would simply mean looking at the difference between the rates you get on three-month money, 10-year money, and 20-year money in different countries. And you can see here that um, rates, even on 20-year money, are extraordinarily low until you get to the, the antipodes or until you get to the emerging markets. And I suspect a lot of you uh, would look at that 16% uh, you can get from Russia um, and still not be terribly tempted by it. 
This is, um, this is, if you like, our reality. This is the bulk of the developed world. If you look at the, the dark blue bars here, that's three-month money. Some of those are negative. We've got negative interest rates at the moment. We got used to zero interest rates. Now we have to get used to negative interest rates. Well, I was brought up to believe that you couldn't have negative interest rates because everybody would just stick their money under the mattress if you had negative interest rates. Uh, why would you actually earn a negative interest rate? Well, if you put it under the mattress, you might get robbed, I suppose, and your household insurance probably doesn't cover much more than a thousand pounds, and you all look like you're good for a lot more than that. Um, so you could, you could hire a standard safety deposit box for 600 pounds a year, and you could put it in the bank in a safety deposit box. Uh, you can get 1,000 Swiss franc notes you can get 16,200 of those in a safety deposit box, which you can hire for £600 a year. So you can actually store £11 million for £600 a year. Uh, don't ask me how I know these things, by the way. <laughs> if that's the case, you know, that would put a bound on the interest rate. So why are interest rates? Interest rates in Switzerland, minus 1%. In Denmark, minus 1%. But look at some of these 20-year rates. They're amazing, too. The 20-year rate on German government bonds is just 0.5%, 50 basis points, 0.5%, amazingly low. So really, I mean, when you look at this, it doesn't look like rates are going to go anywhere fast soon. Perhaps in the United States, they'll start to rise a little bit later this year. In the rest of Europe or Japan, extremely unlikely. In the UK, we're probably a good way off that. But when they do rise, it looks like they're going to rise very slowly indeed. So this is a problem because real interest rates are the baseline for everything else. Every other asset we're going to talk about, this is the baseline for. I mean, for years, we've been teaching in finance here uh, that the uh, return on an asset is equal to the risk-free rate plus a premium for risk. What's the risk-free rate? Well, it's the, the real interest rate on very short-term government securities. And if that's the case, then that sets the baseline for everything else. If real interest rates are low, real equity returns are likely to be low, real bond returns are likely to be low, real property returns are likely to be low. Is that the case? Well, we've got lots of observations of real interest rates. We've got... Uh, 21 countries with a continuous history. We've got 115 years of data, so that's 21 times 115. So we've got all of those observations of real interest rates. What we've done is we've ranked our data, we've sorted them from the lowest real interest rate through to the highest, and then we've looked at what the subsequent rates of return are on equities and bonds over the following five years. And there you see it. The equities are the blue bars, the bonds are the gray bars, and you can see that when real interest rates have been low historically. Bond and equity returns over the following five years have been low. And when real rates of return have been high, then bond and equity returns have been high. And there's pretty much a perfect relationship between the two as you move through the gradations. So the worrying thing today is that we are in a low return world. We're in a low expected returns world, not just for cash, but for everything. Well after we'd chosen the title for this talk, this was the headline of the Investor's Chronicle. And uh, this is one of the main topics you hear over dinner parties at the moment. You know, what should I do with my money? You know, interest rates are low, low growth, low interest rate world. Okay, cash, you can't avoid having some cash, but at these rates on cash, you don't really want more cash than you need to have. Is equities uh, the salvation. Should we be investing in stocks? What are the properties of stocks? Well, the first property of stocks is they're risky. It would be very dishonest to have a talk like this without referring to the risk of equities. And um, this is uh, US rates of return. And those US rates of return are the excess returns. So each of these um, bars, each of these little cells, represents a year. And it shows the return on equities minus cash. So this is the excess return on equities. It's the extent to which US stocks have beaten cash in each of these years. 
And you can see the most popular uh, range here is between 10 and 20 percent. There have been uh, many years, more years than uh, for any other range, uh, when returns have been in that range. What we don't like, of course, is this. We don't like losing money. That's what we mean by risk. Uh, you can see that 1931 was the very worst year ever, where you lost 44% uh, of your money relative to cash. 1933 was the best year ever, where you made 57% relative to cash. And you have this distribution of returns around there. And this is the risk. About a third of the years, you lose money from stocks. That's the United States. That's been one of the more successful markets, and it's also been uh, a market which has been uh, relatively low risk. So if we show you the histograms for other markets, some of them will be much wider than that with much greater prospect of loss. So equities are risky, and uh, the compensating good news is that they are priced in a way that gives you a premium for risk. Investors don't like risk because they don't like risk. They price equities at a discount to the relative to the expected cash flows, at a discount relative to the rate you would get if you were looking at a bond. And so you get a higher rate of return from equities, or at least a higher expected rate of return from equities. But because they're risky, you can never be sure you'll actually get it. This is the uh, rates of return that Americans have enjoyed. They've, they've certainly had a very handsome equity risk premium historically. If you'd invested a dollar back in uh, 1900, uh, by the time you got to the end of 2014, you would have had $38,000, or just scaling it up by 100, in, uh, you would have turned $100 in 1900 into $3.8 million. That's the good news. Uh, the bad news is you would have been long dead by then. <laughs> Uh, and, but let's assume you, you defied the doctors in some way or that you have a bequest motive and that you've wanted to pass this money on to your, uh, to your heirs. Um, you can see that these are phenomenal returns, 9.6% per year from equities. And bonds turned $1 not into $38,000 but into $278 with a return of 5% per year. And bills came in below that uh, at uh, $1 becoming $74. I said just now we should look at everything in real terms. There's been a lot of inflation. You can see that um, even in the United States, there's been 27-fold inflation over this 115-year period, and that's been one of the low-inflation countries. Uh, so let's look at it in real terms. So this is all adjusted for inflation. Adjusted for inflation, $1 has been converted into almost 1,400 times its purchasing power in real terms over 115 years. So the real return on equities has been 6.5% per annum, compared with bonds at 2% and bills at 0.9%. I've added a, another line here, which is um, equity capital gain. That shows that if um, you'd taken your equity portfolio and every time someone had paid you a dividend, you had just dumped it in the waste paper bin which would have been pretty stupid. More sensibly, you would have gone out and you'd have spent it on riotous living. Uh, if you had done that and you had not reinvested your dividends, $1 would have become just $12.8. So the huge return we're showing here in real terms is the power of dividend growth and reinvested dividends over time. And uh, this has, for Americans, uh, generated a very large equity risk premium. Two points here, real returns are what matters, and dividends matter uh, over the long run. This is the British experience. In nominal terms, before we look at the real terms, it's, it's pretty similar to the United States. Uh, 100 pounds became 3 million after 115 years. In real terms, it's less good than the States because we had a lot more inflation. We had 83-fold inflation in the United Kingdom. And um, the real equity return in the UK has been 5.3% compared with the 6.5% for the US. But the UK did less well, but that's still a very handsome equity risk premium over time, 4.3% per annum. Remember, per annum and compound interest means that the terminal wealth uh, compounds up very fast. Here's another country, or rather two other countries, and a, a first glance at this, this is from 1865. Uh, a first glance, you say, I wish I'd been in the red line there. That's the market to be in. 
until those of you with a suspicious bent notice the ending date is 1917. And uh, then I tell you that that is the New York Stock Exchange and the St. Petersburg Stock Exchange. You would have lost all of your money in equities or in bonds if you were a Russian domestic investor in 1917 with the revolution. And it's important when we're building a database to include countries that have not succeeded as well as those that have succeeded. Because one of the things we've been building here is also a world index from 1900. And if you have a world index which ignores Russia and China where investors lost all their money, uh, then you are uh, subject to some pretty serious survivorship bias. So a couple of years ago, we uh, made an effort to improve our database. We had some gaps in it, as you can see. This is the world in 1900. The United Kingdom was actually the largest equity market then, with 25% uh, of the world total. The US was uh, lagging behind at 15%, although it soon overtook. Then Germany was the third largest, France was the fourth largest, and then we had some missing countries. We had Russia and Austria that were missing, and we also had China, although it wasn't a large market, um, it was also missing. And the reason we wanted to infill our database and make sure we had these countries was to avoid this survivorship bias. So we added the two largest missing markets, Russia and Austria, and what we do with Russia in our world index is it's in the world index to 1917, then you lose your shirt on it, and then when Russia comes back in, 19, in the 1990s and uh, the market reopens, uh, Russia comes back into the index with its weighting at that time. So we've added in Russia and Austria, and we've added in China markets with total losses. That was 12% of the world that we didn't have, uh, which we now have. And that was to avoid survivorship bias. Now I'm going to show you how the countries compare and also the world index, which we have been careful to avoid this survivorship bias in. So this is the equity risk premium or the returns on equities, bonds, and bills since 1900 uh, over the 115 years. And these are annualized real returns. So these are all after inflation. The light blue bars are bills, the uh, gray bars are bonds, and the dark blue bars are equities. And the first thing you can see, if you look at it carefully, is that equities beat bonds everywhere, in every single country. Equities did best. And the second thing you can see, uh, with a little extra effort, is that bonds beat bills everywhere. And so life is like it's meant to be. The, the law of risk and return holds. The riskiest asset class, equities, gave the highest return. The next riskiest, bonds, gave the second highest. And bills gave the worst returns. The second thing to notice is the United States with its real return of 6.5% per annum. And um, I'm sorry, this is a little design fault here. This should be here. The 4.5 should be against the world X US. So the world, excluding the United States, gave a 4.5% return, and the United States gave a 6.5%. So our initial concern that the US had done rather well, and that by looking at the US experience, you were getting a biased picture for the rest of the world, was correct. There's been lucky countries, there's been unlucky countries. We're going to focus on the world here. The world had a return of 5.2% in real terms per annum. These are the unlucky countries. A lot of these are old world. They were countries that suffered a lot in the two world wars. Uh, the moral, if you look at uh, Japanese equity returns or German equity returns, is don't pick scraps with your neighbors and then lose. Uh, the moral for other countries, uh, like Belgium and France, is sort of don't get in the way of scrapping partners. If you look at the right-hand side, these are the lucky countries. A lot of these are new world countries, resource-rich countries. Uh, and I'm proud to say uh, most of them are um, British colonies or were at one stage British colonies. Uh, the, exception, the exception being Sweden, uh, but there's, there's always time. <laughs> the historical equity risk premium has been 3.2% against bonds and it's been 4.3% against bills. What do we think it's going to be in the future? Well, Dimson, Marsh, and Staunton 
think it's going to be in the range 3 to 3.5%. Three uh, Marsh is a little bit towards the 3.5% end of that. Uh, why do we think it's going to be less than in the past? Two reasons, really. One is that, um, first of all, we think that over time there's been a re-rating of equities to do with better diversification opportunities, and that's been reflected in historical returns, but you can't expect it to continue in the future. And the second is that the second half of the last century was just too wonderful to be true. And so our estimate of the future equity risk premium is about 3.5%. That's still pretty good. Uh, that means that over a 20-year period, um, you would still expect uh, to double your money relative to cash by putting it into equities. So that's a, a pretty good equity risk premium. This is the wonderful period since 1950. The red bars are uh, 1950 to 99. The blue bars are 1950 to uh, 2015. And you can see that these returns uh, have really been phenomenal since 1950. Put yourself back to 1950. Uh, the equity risk premium, remember, is meant to be the reward investors need to persuade them into equities rather than uh, putting their money into cash. The reward they actually get may be higher than that if they get some windfall gains. Put yourself back to 1950. What sort of returns might you have been looking for? Well, it would have been hard to have been an optimist back in 1950. We just had the most terrible, devastating world war. Uh, the Cold War had started. Uh, we felt under the nuclear threat. And then when we think about what's actually happened over the last 50, 60 years, um, most things have actually, on average, gone pretty well. Uh, the Cold War ended. There was no Third World War. The Cuban Missile Crisis got diffused. Uh, the Cold War ended and the good guys won. At least we thought the Cold War had ended until recently. And um, also there were massive improvements in invention, uh, in innovation, in management, in technology, uh, in shareholder orientation, and so on. And um, this period, uh, we think, was truly uh, the triumph of the optimists, which is the title of a book we wrote uh, a few years back. Let me just remind you also of the power of compounding. You might look at this and think, oh, goodness me, a return of 7%, which is probably where the average lies here, that's no great shakes. Well, a return of 7% real, remember these are all real after inflation, uh, is a lot. After 10 years, you double your money at 7%. After 20 years, you've quadrupled your money. After 50 years, you've multiplied it almost 30-fold. The power of compounding is absolutely phenomenal. So putting money into the equity market and being patient and leaving it there has in the past been enormously successful. In the future, we believe it will be successful, but a bit less so uh, than this period uh, because this was one where the optimists triumphed. The other thing to remember about equities is although they are risky individually, one of the things you will all have learned from London Business School is that when you put stocks into a portfolio, that reduces risk. Well, similarly, when you put countries into a portfolio of countries, that also reduces risk. If you were to um, randomly pick one of our countries, the standard deviation or the dispersion of outcomes would have been around about 28%. Uh, if you had split your money across 20 different countries, it would have been about 20%. And there's a nice gradual fall off in risk as you add more countries. Now, none of us are going to put the same amount of money into Belgium or Ireland as we are into the United States. The US is a huge market, the others are tiny. So it would be probably more sensible to think about what the diversification benefits would be if you capitalization weighted this, or you weighted your holdings by the sizes of the markets. And if you do that, uh, you reduce risk from about 22% if you stick to one country, down to about 17% when you get out to 20 countries. So one of the last free lunches you have in the capital markets is the opportunity to diversify, and diversifying across countries, globally diversifying, uh, is an important lesson of equity investment. Bonds. What can we say about bonds? Here are some highlight statistics, first of all. These are all averages of the last 115 years. And the first thing to notice is the real bond return. I'm showing here the US, the UK, and the world. So the US has generated real bond returns of 2% per year. What do I mean by a bond here? 
I mean a government bond, and I mean a long bond, a 20-year bond. And so these are strategies of investing in bonds with a 20-year maturity and maintaining that maturity over time. So these are the returns you've obtained historically from investing in bonds. This is how much you've got from bonds relative to cash. So this is the premium you've got for being in 20-year bonds rather than in cash. And again, across the world, the average has been about 1%. This is the equity premium. This is how much equities have beaten bonds. And you can see it ranges from 4.4 in the States down to 3.2 for the world. That was the figure I showed you just now. This is quite interesting. This is the ratio of equity volatility to bond volatility. So it's just the standard deviation of one over the standard deviation of the other. And for the world index, it's 1.5. That's the extent to which the equity standard deviation exceeds the bond standard deviation. Or put another way, bonds are about two-thirds as risky in terms of standard deviation as equity. So bonds are riskier when you get out to long bonds than you think in terms of their duration. And finally, of course, you don't have to invest in government bonds. You can also invest in corporate bonds. And the additional premium that you've got on top of the bond maturity premium from investing in high-grade corporate bonds, these are extremely safe corporate bonds, is another um, 64 basis points, 0.64%. So these are the, the highlight figures historically for bonds. Of course, if you invest in very risky corporate bonds, that figure goes up. So as a rough you know, number to bear in mind, long bonds have given around 1% per annum more than cash, historically. But it's not been a smooth ride. When you show these 115-year averages, uh, it conceals a lot. So first of all, we have the world wars. Bonds didn't do very well during the world wars. Uh, German bonds um, particularly didn't do very well, and Japanese bonds particularly didn't do very well. So uh, wars are a pretty bad thing. Uh, deflation is a very good thing for bonds, because bonds promise to pay you a fixed coupon, and that fixed coupon becomes more valuable uh, if there is deflation, because um, instead of deducting deflation, you're adding deflation to get your return. And so in the period from 1926 to 33, when there was deflation pretty much around the world, you got extremely good returns from bonds. The enemy of bonds is inflation and hyperinflation. If you were in Germany in 1922-23, you would have lost everything. If you were in Austria in 1919-22, to 22, you would have pretty much lost everything. You would have lost 98% of your money. Even in the UK, between 1972 and 1974, when inflation was roaring away, you would have lost 50% of your money in real terms in bonds. So inflation is the big enemy of bonds. In the early 80s, the central banks tried to squeeze inflation out of the system, and they won the fight against inflation, and they did that by jacking up real interest rates. And uh, the bond returns were excellent. But here's the most amazing bar of all. The last 33 years has been an amazing golden age for bonds, much more so than you may realize. The return on bonds, and notice I've gone to a second decimal place here for a reason, 7.22%. The reason I've gone to that second decimal place is because the world equity return over that same period was 7.19. So over the last 33 years, world bonds, a portfolio of bonds from around the world, in real terms, would have beaten just a portfolio of equities. That's not the way it's supposed to be. That's not the way that God designed the world. <laughs> it's a very, very strange phenomenon. So, first of all, bonds are a deflation hedge, but they're very vulnerable to inflation. And this is why we've had such wonderful returns from bonds. You can see that from the 1980s onwards, you had, these are the bond yields in the US and the UK, uh, in the 1980s, and you can see how that's been relentlessly driven downwards to 2.5 and 2.3 today. What's our best estimate of bonds in the future? It's not, let me tell you, 7% per annum, real. Your best estimate of the return from bonds in the future 
is 2.5 nominal, not real, and 2.3 nominal in the UK, not real. Because that's what the bond yield will be if you invest in 20-year bonds today and you held them for 20 years. So to extrapolate from the last 30 years bond returns would be complete fantasy. Your best guide to future bond returns is to look at the bond yields you get today. And I showed you the slide earlier of how pitifully low those returns are looking. So bonds don't look exciting, uh, but they have a lot going for them as a relatively safe haven. They have something going for them as a uh, hedge against deflation. And they have one other thing going for them, and that's that they're a diversifier, which is the uh, next thing I want to talk about. Elroy discovered the wonderful, world, uh, wonderful word basophobia. Basophobia is a fear of falling. You are basophobic if you are sitting at the top of this precipice and you are scared of falling over the precipice. And as investors, we have a fear of falling. And I'm going to show you um, some drawdown charts. And drawdown charts are charts which show just how much you can lose and over what duration you can suffer a loss. And I'm going to start by showing you US equities. This is a drawdown chart. Uh, let's look at a very famous drawdown. This one is the, the Wall Street crash. And in September of 1929, you started losing money. And you kept on losing money on a cumulative basis until you had lost nearly 80% of your money in real terms. But you were still, even when the market started to recover, this is a bull market here, um, even when the market started to recover, you're still below water. You still haven't got back to where you were in September 1929. And you have to wait until, you can see the little chink of white there, February 1937, before you actually get back to a position where uh, you had the same amount of money in real terms as you had back in September 1929. So you wait seven and a half years. And then sadly, along comes the Second World War, and you're into trouble again. Uh, the other sort of famous drawdown is, um, is this one, which we've all lived through, which was the March 2000 uh, drawdown when equities hit a serious bear market. And by 2006, 7, they nearly made it back, uh, but they didn't quite make it back in time for the financial crisis, which then came along. And so we had a 13-year drawdown. And you can see that at the worst of the uh, financial crisis, there was a loss in real terms of 55%. So that's the extent of drawdown risk that you can face from equities. You will ameliorate this a little bit if you invest in the world index rather than just the United States, uh, because you'll diversify across countries, but you still are going to have very big drawdowns. Now let's look at bonds. They're going to be much less risky, right? Okay. Well, not exactly. Not exactly. Look at this drawdown. This, this is pretty amazing. There's a red line that runs along the top, so it looks like you never get back to zero, but that, that red line's there for a purpose, and I was unable to remove it. Uh, so you do actually get back. Um, and so starting in 1940, this drawdown ends up with you losing, in the United States, 67% of your money in real terms at the absolute bottom. And it took 51 years for you to get back to the wealth level that you had in 1940 from investing in bonds. The problem is, all of us think about that last 33 years of wonderful bond returns, don't we? Uh, our entire professional careers, bonds have done absolutely wonderfully. But this is what bonds can do to you, and you have to be very, very careful. They are not risk-free. They are less risky than equities but they are by no means risk-free. Let's uh, you know, put the two together. You can see uh, the two sets of drawdowns together. This still dominates, um, and uh, this is still pretty bad. This is the picture for the UK. Uh, in the UK, the, the worst ever bear market was um, the 1973-74 bear market, uh, when investors lost something like from 
peak to trough about 75% of their money in real terms. And you can see the other bear markets over time. And this is uh, UK bonds, and that's the two put together. What if you hold some of each, though? What if you hold some equities and you hold some bonds? What does that do for you? Well, that actually does quite a lot for you. The blend of just 50-50, one and the other, leads to smaller, shorter drawdowns. The blue is the United States, and the red is the UK. We don't have daily data before 1930 for the UK. That's why the UK uh, starts rather late. Uh, all of this is built from uh, daily data going right ba back in time. So another important message is that you get diversification benefits from blending equities and bonds. And the reason you get those diversification benefits is because the bond equity correlation is not one. Yeah, it's less than one. Not only is it less than one, uh, but currently it's been negative. It's been negative since uh, 2000. Uh, it's been negative since a bit before that. And that means that by blending equities and bonds, you reduce risk. So diversification isn't just about diversification across stocks and diversification across markets. It's also about diversification across asset classes. That's also extremely important. A currency. I showed you the benefits of diversification across countries just now. And what I didn't point out to you was that when you invest abroad, you know this, of course, uh, you take on some currency risk. You're not just investing in the US equity market, you're also investing in the dollar. Uh, the figures I showed you were that risk re gets reduced very quickly, notwithstanding the fact that you've also taken on some currency risk. So those figures that I showed you were after taking on currency risk. The question, though, is what do we do about currency when we're thinking about this global portfolio that I'm arguing uh, you should be holding? Do we take it on the nose? Do we hedge it? Um, do we back off completely and stay domestic? Um, well, currency movements can be big. This is the uh, picture since 2000, and um, you can see that there have been some very weak currency countries where the, uh, the dollar has appreciated very markedly against, say, the, the Turkish currency, the Russian ruble, the South African currency, the Brazilian, and so on. And there have been other currencies where uh, the US dollar has depreciated against them. And although we are talking how weak the euro is at the moment, uh, the euro is still stronger than it was back in uh, 2000 at the moment. Not by much, um, and uh, it seems to be narrowing. So these are big differences. If you're investing, and you invest in countries that turn out to have a strong currency, you look a hero. If you invest in countries that look turn out to have weak currencies, you can look a fool. Uh, so currency affects your returns. Uh, this is Britain, of course. But we're looking at the wrong thing. Those were just the exchange rate movements. If we should look at everything in real terms, we should also look at currency in real terms. The real exchange rate is the exchange rate adjusted for the relative inflation of two countries. And um, the reason that's important is because this is the period since 1970, the period of basically uh, floating, um, freely floating exchange rates. This is for 83 different countries. And each blob shows you the annualized exchange rate change relative to the US dollar against the annualized inflation rate relative to US inflation. You can see that the two lie pretty much along a straight line of 45 degrees. The biggest Deviation here is actually Russia, and I don't think that's because it deviates from this theory. I think it's because they weren't paying much attention to the measurement of inflation in Russia during part of this period. And so that, I think, is just a mismeasurement of inflation. What this means is that in real terms, currency movements are much, much less than you believe them to be when you look at the raw currency movements. Long term, <coughs> currency changes are mostly driven by relative inflation, and an economist would say purchasing power parity, at least in its relative form, has held quite closely. So these are the figures I showed you earlier. The dark blue bars are the 
local real returns. So what I mean by that is the dark blue bar for the UK shows the real return a UK investor would have made from equities over the last 115 years. The gray bars are common currency returns. They're in US dollars here, but it could be in any common currency. And the US dollar return tells you the return a US investor would have made in real terms from investing in the UK or from any other country. So you can see that the return a UK investor made from investing in the UK and the return a US investor made from investing in the UK are almost identical. And that's because the real exchange rate change, that's this little tiny red bit at the bottom here, was almost zero over that period. So what was actually happening here well, the UK currency depreciated by about 1% per year over 115 years. And UK inflation was about 1% higher than US inflation over 115 years. And the two cancel out and the real exchange rate uh, is pretty much uh, zero. You can see that in some countries the real exchange rate has been larger than that. But it's never been more than 1% anywhere. And whether we look at returns in uh, local or whether we look at them in common currency, there's really not a huge amount of difference. So for a long-run investor, currency barely impacts your long-run returns. You don't have to worry about it too much. If you don't like currency risk, of course you can hedge it. There are perfectly effective ways of hedging it, cheap ways of hedging it. But if you're a long-run investor, don't hedge it. Because actually what you'll do is you'll get rid of the currency risk but you'll introduce some interest rate risk that you really don't want. And after about seven or eight years as a holding period, you start to find that volatility increases from hedging rather than decreases. So for long-run investors, you don't really need to worry too much about currency. I'm always going to deal with the exotic stuff. I was with my children over the weekend, and uh, they said, what are you going to be doing tomorrow? This is a Sunday. Um, I said, well, I'm going to be recovering from the weekend's festivities. We have a family celebration. They said, what are you going to do the next day? I said, well, um, I'm giving a talk. Um, and I said, what's it for? And I said, it's a 50th anniversary celebration. And so one of the kids said, oh, yes. You once told us you started going out with each other in the beginning of 1965. And I said, well, no, it's London Business School's anniversary. <laughs> <laughs> but you, do, you do make me think of something. There's something to worry about <laughs> as well. Um, <coughs> so I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, uh, what Paul calls the exotic stuff. And um, uh, I'll draw again on work which uh, uh, we've done over time. Um, let me start with, uh, with housing. Uh, one uh, proposition people put to us is that investing in real estate is, um, uh, is a good idea. Real estate always wins. And we don't have 100-year uh, histories for commercial real estate, except in rather special circumstances. So, for example, there is a, uh, a series for Manhattan property, but Manhattan property, commercial property, uh, is unlikely to be typical of uh, real estate in the US as a whole. But we do have uh, now uh, a number of people who have gone down the same route as uh, Paul and I have done. We've collected together financial market returns from different sources. We didn't compile all of these country series for equity markets. We've talked with other academics. And we've drawn on their work. Sometimes we've worked with them to extend their series. But a lot is the work of others. Uh, and there's a man called uh, Neil Monnery who uh, quite recently published a book called Safe as Houses. Uh, and he went down the same journey. He talked to people and discovered that there were a number of housing series. And now there is a, a growing industry of looking at uh, real estate prices. They're all somewhat different. But the six countries which we have data are averaged in the darker red line here. For reasons you'll discover in a moment, I think I should call it the, the claret line. Um, so the claret colored line shows you what the average performance has been. And on average, uh, houses have given you uh, a return of 1% to 2% real per year. Uh, housing is sort of interesting from this point of view. It's given you some capital appreciation. We don't know quite what people spend on improving their property. But we also don't know what the imputed value of the rent was, nor indeed 
uh, the pleasure of owning their own home rather than renting uh, an otherwise similar property. Uh, but we are able, with a long series like that, to look at the relationship between uh, house prices and, uh, uh, and inflation. Uh, and one of the features that we see there is the um, extent to which houses kept pace with or were relatively insensitive to inflation. They actually have a slight negative relationship to inflation. So there's a little bit on real estate. And what I want to do next is talk a little bit about gold, which may be a little bit closer to the hearts of some of you who may simply rent property but may like gold. Gold is the premier asset in many people's mind as an inflation hedge. And let me show you some of the evidence on gold prices. This slightly complicated chart is actually um, quite simple. Um, what we've got is the blue mountains over there in the background. Uh, that is uh, UK inflation. So some people would say, well, uh, we should look at gold as a, a potential inflation hedge. Um, the gold-colored bars are the returns that you get on investing in gold. So that's the nominal return on gold. And so as an inflation hedge, what you'd be looking for are cases where you see inflation being high uh, and the return on gold being high. It uh, doesn't always work like this. Um, but uh, that, 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 that's the background. There are some parts where gold doesn't seem to move around very much, uh, and then there suddenly jumps. Those are the cases where uh, the British pound was pegged to gold, either explicitly through the gold standard or through a link to the US dollar until the Nixon break of linking the dollar with, uh, with gold. Uh, and so you can see cases where it's fairly flat, and occasionally you can see, as was the case shortly after the uh, end of the Second World War, of, of a depreciation. Uh, and then you can see on the right-hand side, uh, once, uh, there was, uh, uh, once there was no longer uh, an effective gold standard and for a lengthy period, you can see considerable fluctuations in the price of gold. Taking the price of gold and taking uh, inflation, we can construct a real return series. So the line plot here, the blue line plot, shows you what the performance has been in real, in inflation-adjusted terms, for investing in gold. Gold, over the period that we looked at, uh, had given you a little over 1%, again, 1% one, one to 2% per year uh, in real terms. But um, as a hedge against inflation, although there is some relationship uh, between inflation, the real return uh, is correlated with inflation. This is very, very patchy. Uh, as a reliable hedge, it's hopeless. So although on average there's something there, um, this is a, um, a, a form of investment which may provide you with some psychic benefits, a term I'll use again shortly. You may feel good about knowing about the lumps of gold that you own. Um, but as a prudent financial hedge against inflation uh, to be taken in, in um, uh, small doses. So what I'd like to look at is that uh, if gold gives you some, some warm feelings, what about other uh, altogether more interesting assets? And gradually we're also finding people who are putting together series that cover long periods. Uh, the first I'll look at is art. Um, let me show you some evidence on the long-term performance of art. This is uh, uh, drawn from uh, a paper that uh, addresses investing in emotional assets, which was written by Christoph Spanger, who's now at HEC Paris, but spent a period as a visitor here. Um, and this is his work, that, although we've, we've, we've used this. Uh, he, he put together data on over 1,000 repeat sales uh, over a very long period from two main sources. The, the standard source is Reitlinger's book on the economics of taste, where uh, this uh, art scholar uh, spent his time looking up prices from all sorts of different sources. And so uh, it's a, an interesting volume, because uh, sometimes, at least Paul and I, get accused by our wives of uh, having a rather strange taste in collecting these bits of old data from long ago. But there are other uh, famous people who are one, regarded as uh, experts in their field who do the same thing, and Reitlinger did exactly that. Um, you can buy our books quite cheap on eBay, but I just bought one of Reitlinger's books. It was even cheaper than one of our old books. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
So uh, we've looked at those prices and created a, a, an index based on repeat sales. The idea of a repeat sales index is you'll have a transaction in something in two different periods, and they might be 20 years apart. There'll be a transaction in a comparable work of art, which might in the first case be somewhat later than the other one, and then there'll be another one which may be later or earlier than the second trade in, in the first artwork. And we can put all of these together and extract from that an indication of what the year-to-year -year movements in art prices are. So what we're doing is let's show you an example from the Reitlinger book. Um, this is just uh, uh, taken out of 1861. Um, uh, an image, uh, a, p a picture called The Childhood of Clotilde, uh, was sold for 420 British pounds. And then in 1872, the same artwork appeared on the market. Those are the repeat sales that we're using. And by exploiting that, one can come up with an estimate of the returns on art. Um, art over the long run has done a little bit better than the uh, emotional assets that I've shown you so far. Something of the order of 2 to 3% per year real, inflation adjusted. Um, we can do the same for stamps. Um, uh, while he was here, um, uh, my co-author, Christoph Spanger, um, I feel a bit bad saying this because it was my idea, but he did it. Uh, he went over to the British Library uh, and spent his time copying prices into his laptop out of old Stanley Gibbons catalogues. Um, but we ended up with a very large array of data on uh, uh, British investment quality stamps. They're just the sorts of things that you'd be persuaded by Stanley Gibbons to invest in. Um, and so uh, here's an example from a particular page where you can see um, that uh, in those days a used penny black would still sell for a penny, um, but you would have got a whole shilling. Uh, so the, the, the penny is an old penny of which there were 240 to the pound, uh, and the shilling is worth 12 times as much as the old penny. Uh, and so an unused one was worth rather more. But it's not always like that. Uh, the the uh, most ardent stamp collectors in the world are the Chinese. Uh, and uh, Chinese stamps, this is uh, uh, communist era Chinese stamps, are worth far more if used than unused. They printed lots of them to sell to stamp collectors to bring in some currency. Uh, but nobody had any money or opportunities or reasons to, sell, to, to, to send letters. So the used ones are worth more. Uh, but not, not typically for the British uh, examples. So we can go through the same sort of process. Um, of course, the repeat sales are frequent because we've got a catalogue that appears every year. Um, and so here you can see the return on stamps, again, of the order of 2 to 3% real per year. Um, another example is musical instruments. The, the, the stamps we collected, um, but the uh, data on musical instruments was collected by a former economics lecturer here called Katie Grady, who went on to Oxford and uh, is, uh, is now, it now lives uh, in, in the US, uh, where, where she's an academic. Uh, and so um, her infatuation was with violins, and she collected uh, a large block of violin data. Uh, she published an article on it, um, but very kindly made her underlying data available uh, to us. She. Um, she had produced estimates of returns decade by decade using this data. And um, uh, my co-author, Christoph, is something of an expert on um, using Bayesian methods to kind of torture the data to reveal what happens year by year. Uh, and so uh, we were able to do something similar. So this is an example of, uh, of the, the, the underlying data. So this is uh, um, a record from uh, Andrew Hill. Uh, who is, is a multi-generational family. This happens to be an illustration uh, of a violin, which you can see up here, is referred to in the accompanying documents as the Lady Blunt, which is offered for sale. Da, 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 da. Uh, but this is a, uh, an example of uh, uh, another sort of collectible. They're not cheap. This one sold for £10 million pounds sterling. Um, so what happens with musical instruments? We don't have all musical instruments. I'm using that term generically, but actually the data is based on uh, uh, something of the order of 4,000 uh, violin sales from 1900 onwards. Uh, again, 2 to 3 percent real. Um, and then let me tell you about investing in wine. Um, 
Uh, there are many things that I haven't succeeded with, but I'm a definite failure as somebody who should have been the fourth generation wine merchants. So the, the family wine business was my uh, great grandmother's and then my grandmother's and my father took it over. Um, and uh, that was the end of the, the story. It was almost the end of the story. We still have the, um, some of the leftovers from the business which are I I in a cellar and I just received an email uh, late this afternoon from Christie's and I was saying, we've got to put an end to all of this. Will you come round and value what we've got? And Christie's has sent me a rather deflating email saying they've looked at the inventory that I sent over uh, and it's very interesting but they recommend another auctioneer to come round and have a look at it. <laughs> so, so what can I do? Uh, I, can, you know, I can crunch numbers like Paul was describing, um, but just as well I didn't become a wine merchant. Um, so w um, we, we uh, collected data on, on Premier Cru, or what to Americans, since we always write these papers for an American audience, first growth, not Premier Cru, which is speaking foreign. Um, <laughs> so uh, we've got the, the, the five fine Bordeaux. Um, we uh, collected data from uh, uh, 1900 onwards, actually uh, uh, end of 1899, uh, for wines with vintages uh, from 1855 onwards. Uh, we didn't use data on magnums or half bottles, just standard bottles for reasons which will become clear. And so we had two types of transactions. We were helped by Christie's. So re Christie's really should have helped me, not sent me a lousy, <laughs> lousy uh, email this afternoon to put me off now. Um, so we took the Christie's prices um, and we took dealer prices. So uh, um, Simon Berry, who's now the chairman, was the chief executive. Simon Berry uh, is uh, a keen historian and has gone back and collected all sorts of artifacts that uh, represent the history of uh, his company in St. James, which is between three and four hundred years old. Um, and so uh, altogether we collected uh, 36,000 wine prices, each one collected by hand. Um, and uh, 9,000 combinations of different year, chateau, vintage, and transaction type, whether it's an auction or, or a dealer transaction. So the idea there is that uh, the different combinations of wine prices enable us to explore the evolution of wine prices over time. And the second 9,000 combinations enables us to look at repeat sales in the same way as the other uh, series that I was showing you. Um, so what does this data look like? Uh, at Christie's, what we ended up with was going through annotated catalogues. So these are catalogues which had been printed for each auction and then marked up by the auctioneer. So here's an example of one. Um, and so you can see there's uh, some claret up there. Those that are sitting at the front may be able to see that um, lot 114 um, is marked with a two. That's two cases, two dozen bottles. Um, people might want to sample the wine, of course. Um, and then, uh, so that's uh, Chateau Clermont, uh, Chateau Petrus, which was not quite so great at, the time, but at that time, wouldn't have been quite so highly regarded. Um, but what I always remember is, um, sorry about this, it's my Uncle Cyril, my Uncle Cyril, uh, who always used to, to want my father to bring up to, 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 to his house, he lived in the north of England, uh, Chateau Ikem. Uh, and this was, this was his absolute passion. So, uh, here you can see that the two cases of Chateau Ichem, it says two dozen bottles of Chateau Ichem, 25, uh, um, and then it says one and ten twelfths. So they've sampled one bottle, they've even got on to sampling a second bottle. <laughs> <laughs> so we've got these, these prices and it's in the judgment of the auctioneer, so the auctioneer would tell you, as to whether there's some sampling, if that will increase the, the uh, uh, realised price. So people seem to like increasing the price <laughs> that the Chateau Ikem would go for and uh, had uh, less interest in the Cheval Blanc over there. So we had the, 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 uh, all of this stuff with the scribbles over it and the prices that were realised uh, in auction. So a fit the, the top right-hand corner is 56 shillings, so 20 shillings to the pound. Um, although you are coming back, many of you, from years ago and there were scarcely any people from outside the UK back in those days, but uh, those who are younger here will have been drawn from all over the world, so I still have to explain shillings. Um, and we went then to other data sources that Christie's were very helpful with. And then we did something similar with uh, Berry Brothers, so the, the, the prices had been bound up um, 
Uh, and so this is a, uh, one, one example of a Berry, Berry Brothers price list. If you go into their shop, they haven't changed the format since 1900. This is a 1909 price list. So these are exactly the same format, although the scale of the inventory is much larger. And so we were able to look through that for the prices that we wanted. Uh, and then uh, after the uh, bound sets that Simon Berry had assembled, some loose price lists, and then moving on to the website. So what happened there? Um, the, uh, uh, the, the, the wine price index, which in, in this case we adjust for storage costs and for insurance costs, using some uh, industry sources for that, uh, give you a return of about 4% per year um, in real terms, real British pounds. So the orange bars are nominal returns and the red line plot shows you what the cumulative real returns were like. So there were negative real returns, the red line dipping downwards over the first quarter century, and then a boom and bust over World War II. So World War II um, was uh, accompanied by a number of charity sales. Uh, the charity sales were called Red Cross sales. Uh, wealthy individuals would clear out their cellar. Um, the wines would be auctioned. Uh, people would bid high. Um, and this was a sort of means of helping the war effort. Um, but in the process, they appear to have pushed up prices for other wines as well. So rather oddly, there was a, a bubble. This is not champagne, but there was a bubble <laughs> in, the, in wine prices uh, over the war, which then, which then uh, di disappeared. And there was strong, strong growth over the last half century with some periodic setbacks. And what we find is that there is um, uh, a noticeable relationship with uh, the stock market's performance. So here's a few of them. We've left out the violins because the violins, um, were, although we've got these year-by-year -year numbers, um, that we, don't, we haven't assembled the underlying data. There's substantial positive correlation between equities and wine returns, which does suggest there's a sort of wine... Uh, that there's um, uh, a wealth effect here. That is that some of these collectibles appeal more when people are more wealthy, and they tend to be more wealthy at times when the stock market has done well. Uh, and there's similar correlations, but they're not tied to one another. Um, so although transaction costs are high, if this is something which you're doing not to invest but to enjoy, um, you can see the performance is substantially inferior to that of equities. It's quite similar to the performance that Paul showed you of equities ignoring the dividends. So if you would value the psychic dividends of knowing that your wine cellar is a wonderful wine cellar, uh, or of people, your, your guests admiring the artworks on your wall, if that's roughly equivalent to the financial dividend you would get from equities, then the two are, are level pegging. I'm going to end with uh, um, sinfulness. Um, and uh, th this has become, in investment circles, quite a hot topic over the last few years, the, the question of uh, how you behave as a responsible investor. It's typified by uh, the sorts of books you can find uh, in the area. Peter Cameo's book, The SRI Advantage, is subtitled Why Socially Responsible Investing Has Outperformed Financially. And John Harrington has a book, Investing with Your Conscience, How to Achieve High Returns Using Socially Responsible Investing. So the idea is, be responsible, and you will buy into companies that people value. And in investing in companies which do good things, you'll perform well as an investor. So the saints, the saintly companies, or investing in saintly companies, will be rewarded for you. Uh, now, those may not be the books that you like. Uh, let's start with this one on the right, Caroline Waxler's book, How to Crush the Market with Vice-Based Investing. So she uh, sells the idea of stocking up on sin. But the one that you might like the most is Dan Aaron's book, Investing in Vice. <coughs> I have to read this for you at the back. The recession-proof portfolio of booze, bets, bombs, and butts. <laughs> And so the idea there is that if you invest in vice stocks, and Dan Ahrens wrote this book and then launched a fund known as the Vice Fund, which we'll return to shortly, um, the idea was that uh, sinners get rewarded in the market and that investing in nasty companies is the way to go if you want to be rewarded financially. So which view is correct? Could both views be correct? This was 
uh, one of the themes that uh, Paul and Mike and I followed in the 2015 uh, Global Investment Returns Yearbook. Let's show you um, the Vice Fund. The Vice Fund is here in blue uh, from its launch date onwards. And then I've taken a fund which was launched just before the Vice Fund and rebased it to the start date of the Vice Fund. So uh, you can see that you were um, a third to a half wealthier, depending on the date that you choose on the right-hand side, investing in Vice rather than the Vanguard uh, Social Index Fund, which invests in stocks that have been screened by FTSE, the index compilers, to be uh, invested in really nice companies which make you feel good. Um, so Vice, in this case, beat Virtue by 1.7% per year. And there's quite a lot of supportive evidence from a range of different uh, researchers in this area. Um, let's just have a look at the long-term evidence. Um, Paul refers to uh, some of these nasty companies as, as uh, companies that work in syndustries. Um, and the syndustries for which we have long-term data are particularly tobacco and alcohol. Uh, you can see on this chart uh, two blue lines, dark and light blue, uh, for the performance of tobacco companies. You can see in two lines, which are variations of the claret color, uh, the performance of the market. The US tobacco series starts at the beginning of 1900. Uh, and then what I've done for convenience, although the currency is different, is simply to link the British tobacco series so the performance of the, the tobacco sector in the UK, uh, to the same point uh, that would have been applied at that date uh, in the US. And then the lower lines are the market. And so you can see from 1900 the two markets. Um, so if you look on the um, left-hand part of this chart, UK tobacco chain-linked in this sort of way, which may be a bit unsatisfactory, got 14.8 compared to... 9.4 from the market, but it's probably better to look at the post-1919 period, 13.1 compared to 10.3. And US tobacco earned you 14.6 compared to 9.6 uh, from the US stock market as a whole. Um, the British tobacco series starts late because that's when t the tobacco index came into existence. Uh, when it comes to alcohol, uh, the Americans mess things up for us because they have a similar gap, but it's not at the beginning, it's, it's in the middle because of prohibition. So the charts would be a bit more difficult to, to, to uh, compile, but if we just look at the UK, um, the uh, alcohol industry was the best performing industry that you could find that has a complete history from 1900 to the beginning of this year. So um, uh, how to interpret that? To interpret that, we need to think a little bit about whether people like particular sorts of investments. And we can perhaps gain some insight by looking at investing in countries that are nice or not so nice. We don't have really long-term data on, um, uh, on the equities of different countries because the ranking of those countries by, their, by, by the standards of behavior in those countries is a little bit more difficult. Uh, in the second half of the 1990s, the World Bank uh, started producing estimates of various forms of governance in different national markets. They cover 150 uh, countries. Um, and they have six different criteria, one of which I'll focus on, which is corruption. Uh, and uh, they produce their corruption measures based on surveys, which are typically, depending on the, the, the different governance measures, that's typically uh, eight to ten different measures which they're averaging together. And so we've taken all countries which in 2000 were part of the FTSE World uh, Index Series, uh, which was uh, 40, 40 markets, or approximately 40. I can't, can't remember if it was exactly 40 or, or just a shade over. Um, and what we've done is we've taken uh, those which were scored as being excellent on these measures, um, any Canadians here? You're beyond corruption, but, <laughs> but, but so are the British, so we are excellent. Good. Uh, that's the Americans, a few of those there, yes. Uh, 
So Americans get a, a corruption score, which is a, it's a pr pretty straightforward country, but isn't uh, scored the highest. Um, their scores uh, range between minus two and a half and plus two and a half. Uh, and so if it's between zero and one, we uh, just label this for convenience acceptable, and then there's being on the wrong side of zero, which mostly is sort of countries where you could have guessed that they would have a lower score. Um, but uh, about one quarter of the countries, it's 13 altogether, um, have a poor rating. It's interesting to look at their performance over time. And um, uh, although this data only covers one and a half decades, uh, you can see that uh, the poor poorly governed, or in this case, uh, um, uh, supposedly corrupt markets, are ones where equities did better. This coincides to some extent with emerging markets um, which um, have improved their governance and standards of behavior over time. Uh, but you could interpret this as being indicative of the fact that there's a risk exposure there, and uh, people would not pay as much for uh, a similar investment in a country where governance standards are low compared to one where they're high. So returns were highest in the most corrupt countries. We have a number of other bits of evidence which we cite in our written work. Why might sin pay? Well, oddly enough, um, one explanation is that responsible investors are what causes all of this. If responsible investors have an impact, then if enough investors avoid vice businesses, that will depress the share prices of those companies. If it depresses their share prices, they'll offer higher expected returns. And those higher expected returns are available to those who are not so troubled by investing in tobacco, weapons, uh, uh, gambling, and so forth. Um, and there is another possibility, and that is that the higher rewards may also be a kind of risk premium, a premium that you get because Overhanging these companies is the risk of uh, litigation, the risk of further regulation, and so forth. So let me uh, make a few concluding remarks. I know we've overrun uh, somewhat, but I'll, uh, I'd just like to have a couple of slides which take you through some of these issues. I'm going to start largely with the topics that Paul was talking about. Um, what should you be asking yourself? Um, first of all, we'd say that it's important to ask what are the risks um, that you face, and which of those risks are rewarded. So equity risk. It's clear right from the beginning and from your first finance course that other things equal if you had two investments um, with the same expected return, the one that's more volatile is less attractive. There's maturity risk. Maturity risk isn't quite so straightforward. Paul's talked about credit risk. And there's lots of other factor exposures which um, and we haven't spoken about, but uh, which, which we do enjoy writing about. To address those risks and, and, and whether you would uh, um, want to go for those that are rewarded, you have to ask what risks you can tolerate. You need to think about issues such as uh, your age, income, wealth, your needs, liabilities, your motives for bequests. And in particular, the language of investment has moved in the last uh, uh, couple of years, perhaps the perhaps the last four years, to talking about what you would do in the bad times. So your planning is not for what you expect, but for the unlikely events that would be painful. Um, you should always go for a free lunch if it's really free. People often spot free lunches that aren't free, but there are a number that are there. Paul's talked about diversification. Uh, in any MBA course here, if you can't think of the answer in a finance course, uh, any uh, thinking student shouts out diversification. Decent chance you get some marks for class participation. There are some others. Um, uh, you might think about uh, tax breaks that you get uh, and the efficiency of, of uh, the, uh, the tax efficiency of your investment. Um, and so there's no point in uh, giving money to the government. If you want to make a charitable donation afterwards, you can do that, but you might want to send it somewhere else. Um, uh, for fixed income investors, there are often guarantees. So uh, I don't know whether you've heard the phrase in relation to banks, too small to fail. Uh, so I'm talking now about Britain. In Britain, uh, a couple who invest money with a financial institution are guaranteed by the British government to receive uh, a compensation of up to £170,000. And there's no limit to the number of these banks that you can put money with. 
if you put all your money, and it was uh, larger than that sum, um, in one big bank, of course, we know big banks can fail. They have. But little banks can't, because the British government will compensate you. So uh, they won't probably be allowed to fail, because uh, if you've got lots of little depositors, this is just too expensive for the government to, to, uh, 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 to cope with. So guaranteed uh, funds uh, enable you to uh, earn rather more than you could by putting money straight in the hands of the British government, because uh, you'll earn a much higher return and have no more risk than you would if you bought gilts. You should be minimizing fees, uh, and uh, ultra-low cost investing uh, is, is now a uh, uh, big business. I don't know whether you've watched the uh, um, author of uh, Random Walk Down Wall Street, Burton Malkiel, whose uh, investment company, in a matter of a couple of years, has brought in enormous, enormous sums from uh, offering um, a tax-efficient uh, and low-cost investing. Um, and finally, uh, the other free lunch is to have liquidity when you need it. So you can invest in ways which will generate cash when you need it or ways which won't. Uh, and if you're able to realize the cash that you need at the time of your choosing, uh, that's much less costly than realizing cash at the wrong time where you have to pay for liquidity. Should you do it yourself? At business school, we always think as though we're teaching people to do stuff for themselves. Um, but in investments, there's the heavy approach to do it yourself, um, and you should do it if you enjoy it. Um, picking stocks may for you be like uh, collecting stamps for other people. Um, there are other ways of doing it. There's what we would call do-it-yourself light, keeping it very simple uh, and very cheap, using ultra-low-cost uh, um, uh, exchange-traded funds. Um, it might be enough to have some cash that earns a low interest rate, to have a long bond sitting alongside it, uh, and a global ETF, and that will cost you almost nothing to run. Um, or you might want to use advisors or managers. You might want to consider the costs of doing that. You might want to consider the conflicts that they face, the complexity of it all, and whether they really are capable enough. So those are our comments on financial investment. What about uh, collectibles? Are there any questions to ask yourself there, which may also give you some insights on financial investment? Um, here's a picture which came up for auction not so long ago. It's a Gauguin. Um, and here's another picture. It's a Gauguin. Uh, uh, the one on the left came up at Sotheby's in May 2000. The one on the right came up at Christie's in May 2000. Which one would you buy? <laughs> uh, it may help you to know about the paperwork. Um, the one on the left came from the New York art dealer, Sakai. Uh, the one on the right had a full certificate of authenticity. Sakai had a good reputation. Which one would you buy? Now, they can't both be, be the real McCoy. And um, what Sakai had done was he bought high-quality but still second-tier artworks. He then had replicas painted. He took the real artwork round for authenticity, and he would then hang on to it for a long time and um, sell the clone with the certificate of authenticity that was provided for the original one, until by sheer fluke, having passed on the original original rather than the copy, uh, they both ended up at the two auction houses at the same time, which caused some embarrassment. Um, so you'd never have spotted it. That's the fake. And finally, let me end up with the, the same sort of question for you. Uh, which bottle of Petrus would you buy? Well, let me, let me make it slightly easier. Is there anything you could eliminate? Which bottle of Petrus would you not buy? So. Well, who says you would not buy this one? Not buy this one? Not buy this one? Not buy this one? Why would you not buy this one? Well, somebody's drunk it, yes, but actually, you order a bottle of Petrus in, in, in a restaurant and try to hang on to the bottle afterwards. Uh, there's a market in those. Um, 
This one's a bit scruffy. They are different vintages, so we can put that to one side. You can barely read the vintages from where you are. Can you spot any other differences apart from a scruffy label? Yes. Anything more? The second one from the right looks too new. This one looks too new. Um, anything else you can say about that? Look at the bottle. Are there any differences in the bottle? Look at the capsule. So you've, you've got the right answer. That's the fake. The bottle is not a Petrus bottle. It's different. And the capsule is not a Petrus capsule. Uh, you would rather have the one on the extreme left rather than the one that is labelled fake here. So when it, comes to, um, when it comes to investing in collectibles, it isn't quite as straightforward as Paul's favourite solution of buying a, a, a global index fund where if there's 8,000 in the va Vanguard global fund out of those 8,000 securities, you'll have all of them in proportion to their value. You can't do that for collectibles. So you have to take advice and, and, and focus. In taking advice, you'll end up with a, a considerable exposure. It's an undiversified portfolio. There is no choice. Um, you need the right sort of advice. Um, and uh, the sort of wisdom that you can do without as an equity investor is essential if you're going for collectibles. And I think that covers uh, everything we're going to talk about. So uh, we've overrun a bit. But let me just tell you where you can look at more of these things that we've been discussing. We've been producing these books uh, since uh, the beginning of the 2000s, but we've published them with uh, Credit Suisse for um, uh, a number of years now, since 2009. And so 2009, 2010, different themes each year. Um, and you can download them all going to an incredibly complicated Credit Suisse address. We'll put in this tiny URL tinyurl.com slash DMS, which stands for our initials, yearbook 2015, or you can put DMS YB 2014 or 2013 or whatever. So uh, it won't be printed for you, but uh, uh, you can access them on the web easily. That's all we have to say. Thank you for listening. No, I, I, I have strong views about this. So uh, Paul is probably much more nuanced than me. So I think <laughs> have his considered judgment. Uh, I think you should get it from the person who's got the strongest views, actually. Um, yeah. the, the problem about investing everything in a lump sum is it doesn't quite describe life anyway. I mean, we, we, we tend to get our wealth gradually over time. Um, the lump sum approach, you hit the danger of uh, it might be just a bad starting time. And um, the returns we've been talking about obviously depend quite a lot on when you start and when you, when you finish. And there's a lot to be said for the drip feeding in uh, because it, it's a good discipline and it forces you to invest both when you think the market's overvalued and when it's undervalued. Um, and, you know, on average, you'll, you'll pick up a bit of each. So I, I, I actually prefer and think it's a more realistic description of where we come from, uh, the, the gradual investment and saving over time. It starts off with a lump sum. Uh, and what sort of period would one be looking at for a drip feed if you start oh, if, you, if you start off with a lump sum, should you drip feed it in or not? Well, I mean, I think if you start off with a lump sum, you've got, you've got to make an asset allocation decision and you've got to invest it. Uh, but, uh, and and I, I think you, you need to form a view. I think you would be foolish, whatever the timing, whatever your thoughts were on the market, not to be at least partly at equities. And, um, but I think that's completely wrong. What? I think that's completely wrong. Do you? Yeah. <laughs> Go on I then. think if there is an optimal asset mix, to deviate from your optimal asset mix by holding loads of cash, which is probably what it's going to be, for a prolonged period rather than holding your optimal asset mix is a big mistake. Suppose you think that the optimal asset mix is, say, 80% in equities, and you're going to start with 10% and then 20 and then 30. You're underweight equities for a long period. You may want to have, make, ensure that over the, the period of your savings, it'll work out right, so you may have to be... That wasn't what I was saying. You were saying 
drip feed it in. I think that's a mistake. No, no, no. Don't. If, if you start with a lump sum, if you start with a lump sum, you, you have to make an asset allocation decision and you have to decide what to do with it. But most of us have savings that don't arrive in a lump sum. They arrive gradually over time. So that, that's all. Oh, that's just dodging Mark's question. <laughs> nice. Thank you. <laughs> um, we're economists. Uh, what's surprising is you've only got two answers from us. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you've covered an amazing amount of ground. There's one thing that you didn't cover, which is investing in selling things you don't have, which is a hedge yeah. and short activity. Maybe you should next time try and produce returns for short term. That yeah, well, <laughs> maybe you have. Oh, no, the, the, uh, I sent a, an email to Paul saying what we had not done we thought we might uh, use up the full hour that was allocated to us. <laughs> what we had not done is to talk about uh, other sorts of risk premia. Uh, and so when people talk about the superior return from small companies compared to large companies, um, that would be the way we'd put it up in a generalist way on a slideshow. But actually, if you implement that, it's a long, short, long, small companies, short, large companies, or long, short, between value and growth and so forth. So we got awfully close to it um, and um, we didn't add that in, but I mean, we, do, we, we, we do have quite a bit on, on premia, which is very, very, very yeah. close. I mean, if you just short stuff, um, exactly. you, you, it, it's crazy. Uh, because I mean, if you short equities, you, you, you are shorting the equity risk premium and, and that's a sure way to, to lose money. If you do what a hedge fund does, that, that's much more sensible. Um, the, the idea there, at least in principle, is that you don't just take advantage of your good buying ideas, but you take advantage of your good selling ideas, and, and you therefore have long and short positions in stocks, but also in factors and, and so on. The only problem with hedge funds is they come at um, a very large price, and uh, so it falls foul of our uh, advice on looking for low-cost investments. And the evidence on hedge fund returns um, is, is quite patchy, although it's quite difficult to interpret because not all of the hedge fund evidence is, uh, is there in the sense that uh, some of the more successful funds or some of the less successful funds simply don't disclose what they're doing. So the databases are, are, are pretty imperfect. But insofar as we can tell, hedge fund returns after costs are, are not a brilliant deal. The idea is a pretty good one. I thought I was getting a few friends that are interested in wine. Are you not going to not end up with any friends in the audience from the, <laughs> from the hedge fund community, are you? <laughs> <laughs> they, they, can, they can defend their record. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, inflation indices get really flaky when you go back in time. And, um, for example, in the UK, from 1900 onwards, they were measuring something like 20 commodities. They were intended as a measure of what the working classes bought. Um, that was what they were designed to produce. Uh, they were not measured very effectively. Then there's all the debates, even today, about uh, CPI versus RPI. Um, and then there's all the debates about technology and its impact on inflation indices. So if you bought a television in 1950, it's a rather different sort of beast than the television today. Or if you bought a mobile phone 15 years ago, it's rather different from today's smartphone technology. If you just compare the prices, you're missing the technological advances. So uh, yeah, it, it's, it's, a, it's, a big, it's a big issue. Um, and. Uh, all you can really do is, is use the best you can find and put in some health warnings about it, which is what we try, we try to do. But I think the, the evidence on the extent to which long-term exchange rate changes track relative inflation is quite compelling, even though the indices for those, those relative inflation numbers are, uh, are individually flaky. Uh, and so, as you saw, if you jump 
away from looking at local currency returns adjusted for local inflation using flaky indices to looking at common currency returns, the stories that we pursue are, uh, uh, they, they tell the same, same tale. So um, I, think, I think it is surprising that over the long term, indices which are really sometimes very thin on these countries still produce uh, performance numbers that are surprisingly close to what you would expect just looking at exchange rates changes. Paul, uh, how would be the average wage <coughs> as an indice? Um, yeah, I mean, the average, average wages uh, historically, forgetting the last few years, have, have risen faster than prices. And uh, so, again, it depends what you, what you actually want to measure here. But if you're, if you're trying to measure your purchasing power, I think, I think you're... RPI, yeah, I think, I think if you're trying to measure purchasing power, you're, you're better sticking to indices of, of price levels rather than of, of wages. Um, of course, it's reversed over the last few years with, with wages lagging behind prices. One last question. Yeah, so, <coughs> so one question. Uh, what is your view about using leverage to, and in particular, if you're investing in a low, relatively low risk asset class and that doesn't fit your risk profile and therefore you lever it up in order to match your risk profile? Do you, have, you, have you thought about that? It's called the LTCM strategy, so yeah. carry on, Paul. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, most, most of us uh, don't have levered portfolios. We have, we have portfolios that, that actually have a, a strong element of, of cash and, and bonds and so on in it. Um, so if you want to lever up, the first thing you do is you, you eliminate the cash and you, you cut down on the bond content. Uh, but if you want to pick on a specific asset class, which you think is seriously undervalued, then by all means use leverage. But I, I think you're, you're, you're stepping out of the, the kind of, you're stepping out of the framework we were working within tonight, which is you know, what the average person should do with their money or the, the informed person to a kind of expert mode uh, as soon as you do that. And that's fine if, if your hobby is, is trading uh, and setting up clever strategies. Um, there are people who do extremely well on that. And there are some here tonight, uh, but that—that's I think a bit beyond the scope. You know, this, for most of us, it, that's a "don't try it at home" kind of strategy. <laughs> I'm going to stop there, if I may. Um, we pride ourselves because we have having a combination of rigor and uh, relevance, and I don't think you could have seen a much better example of this tonight in terms of the underlying work that went into this and the interest of what's emerged. I can't believe also that at least one preconcept, long-held preconception, each of us hasn't been blown out of the water <laughs> by some of these things which we've seen now. Elroy, Paul, and, and Mark, thank you very much. Mike finally joined us here this evening. Thank you very much indeed. <laughs>